How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, so, uh, there is like, you know, the like 0.1% chance that I'll get a phone call during this, um, and I'll have to like disappear <laughs> related um, to your but cake, uh, in likely, your... but you both know the reason. Yeah. So, gotcha. Just as a heads up. Gotcha. That's a, if you send me your slides, I can flip through them and make up things for you. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So it's that soon, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we're on YouTube. Okay. Sounds good. Well. <laughs> so I'll just wait one more minute and then I'll I'll introduce you. Yeah, so I think we're getting there. So, um, so I'll go ahead and get things started. So welcome back, everybody. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker today, Adam Kaufman um, from Jilla, from uh, Colorado, uh, who will be telling about us his research in alkaline earth atoms and optical tweezers, which are some of the topics we've heard a lot about at the school. Um, so Adam did his PhD at Colorado, where he did pioneering experiments on tunnel coupled optical tweezers and then uh, did a postdoc, uh, that was with Cindy Regal, and then did a postdoc with Marcus Greiner at Harvard, where he sort of pushed the frontiers of quantum gas microscopy. And now he has his own lab where he's uh, combining a lot of these things and continuing to advance these, um, these topics and, and bringing alkaline earth atoms into the mix. Uh, Adams won some awards. Uh, he was the thesis prize, the Damop thesis prize winner, as you know, maybe some of you in the audience will be someday. And uh, he ha he's an O&R young investigator. So um, many accolades that are well-deserved and we're looking forward to his talk. Whenever you're ready, Adam. Uh, thanks a lot, kid. Uh, you can hear me fine? Yes, cool. Uh, Good. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a, I have to say I'm really sad that this, this school in particular actually couldn't be in person. Uh, but uh, hopefully many of you can uh, visit Boulder or uh, attend more of these schools in the future. Uh, okay, so I've, I've actually, uh, despite what Kane said, construed my sort of mission statement here a little bit broader than just going over my research. Uh, I'm really going to try to give a picture of you know, what this field, which has been growing over the past three years of alkaline earth atoms and optical tweezers, uh, what its motivations are, what has happened during that time, and uh, uh, what, like, what, why, why it's being pursued. Um, okay, so uh, I'll start by giving, uh, uh, I really liked the way um, Antoine sort of defined quantum science as really just the project of quantum state engineering. And, and this, you know, I would say characterizes both much of the work that we do in my lab, but also the like the ultra cold matter program as a whole. A lot of it just falls into this category of how can we uh, engineer or understand uh, uh, quantum states uh, uh, for interesting uh, scientific applications. So these include things like quantum communication where we're trying to transmit information in a secure way over long distances, uh, quantum simulation about which we've heard a lot during the school so far, uh, quantum computing, so this falls into the category of what Chris Monroe was uh, speaking about earlier. Uh, and finally, also metrology, so this, you know, uh, June's talk, Anna Maria's talk, uh, uh, perhaps other talks as well. Um, and surely uh, this talk too will we'll discuss the concept of um, uh, specifically looking at atomic clock physics using tweezers. Okay, so uh, uh, one question you might ask is, you know, what do I want for like an all powerful quantum science system. Of course, there's, there are many different um, uh, scientific directions that one might pursue that don't necessarily require all of the capabilities that I'm about to describe, but you know, having them all is, is actually quite useful. So first, let me say that you know, if, I, if I wanna make uh, uh, a well-controlled and understood quantum system, uh, I'm really gonna wanna have many identical quantum objects, that is many identical qubits. And I say qubits here, but you might be interested in, in um, uh, uh, systems that have quantum degrees of freedom that go beyond just two. Um, furthermore, furthermore, we'd want these uh, qubits to be long lived in time, that is to be able to store quantum co coherence for long periods of time. We'd like the ability to have single particle control, that is to individually control these qubits and furthermore read them out uh, with high fidelity. 
And finally, um, uh, we'd like the ability to allow these qubits to interact. And this allows us to really fully um, uh, uh, explore and exploit the Hilbert space available to these qubits. Um, so remarkably, uh, you know, there are a lot of systems these days that are, are sort of chipping away at combining all of these capabilities with increasingly um, uh, better performance metrics. Uh, and some of these, you know, we've already heard about during the school. So one is trapped ion systems, which is a really uh, uh, mature system at this point, uh, ultra cold atoms. Um, uh, there was this amazing paper from um, uh, uh, Jawai Pan's group looking at sampling problems with photons. Uh, atoms and tweezers, like we heard about from Antoine, uh, molecules and lattices, like we heard about from June, uh, and then other platforms as well, like superconducting qubits and NV centers, which didn't actually feature in this school, but also have been doing a lot of really interesting physics in this in this area. So, um, you know, ad, ad, as advertised by the, the title of this talk, uh, you know, the work that, that my group has really focused on is uh, atoms and tweezer arrays, and also will be the focus of this talk. Um, and so just in case you missed Antoine's talk, uh, just to give a very quick bit of context, uh, uh, the optical tweezer uh, uh, paradigm operates as follows. You have a microscope objective, that's this thing up here. You guys can see my mouse fine, yeah? Should I switch the laser pointer? Let's switch the laser pointer. Mouse works for me. Okay, here, that's a little bit a little bit better. Although I think you're colorblind, right? Are you colorblind? You're not, uh, that's we'll a weird number that I have there. Okay. Um, uh, so you have a microscope objective, you shine light into this microscope objective, which makes a tight focus inside a vacuum chamber. This piece of glass here is meant to illustrate the, uh, the window into the vacuum chamber. Um, and then just because of the AC Stark shift imposed by the, the focused light, you can make a trapping potential for atoms. Um, and importantly, when these traps are small enough, you get into a regime where you can trap individual single atoms. Um, and importantly, this same microscope that you use to make the traps, you can also use to collect fluorescence from the atoms and make images like these on the right. Um, uh, on the right here, I'm showing you an averaged image of single atoms in an optical tweezer array. Uh, in this case, these are actually strontium atoms from my group. Um, let me point out that, uh, uh, I'm sure Antoine mentioned this, but this, this basic technology was pioneered in the Grandier group in Paris back in the 2000s. Uh, and perhaps I'll add one other figure of merit that's useful to have in your head is that these tweezers form traps that are sort of 10 megahertz scale deep. So a half a millikelvin to a millikelvin deep. Good. Um, so please stop me by the way, if you have any questions as I go along here. Um, so, you know, in general, these, the, these, uh, th this sort of, this technology has been used for a variety of directions in part because it just combines a number of really nice capabilities. So one is that you can make arrays of tweezers and rearrange them into, um, many different configurations. So this is a, a picture here where the top is a randomly filled array of tweezers. And then an additional tweezer is, uh, uh superimposed on top of this uh, upper array and then moves the atoms into some ordered configuration of interest. So, you know, they were really interested in this heart quantum simulation, apparently, in the bottom right. Um, so, as I mentioned, in addition to being able to um, uh, uh, individually control the atoms using this microscope, you can also read out the atoms with single site resolution or single tweezer resolution. Uh, and we've used this in our lab, for instance, for looking at correlation, two particle correlation functions and how atomic coherence evolves in an array of, uh, of atoms, uh, each of which is in a superposition of two states on a clock transition. Um, but of course, this can also be used for things like two particle or multi-particle observables in a quantum simulation context. Another important feature of the optical tweezer array platform is that it allows for extremely high duty cycle experiments and therefore high precision. What I mean by this is that um, if you compare say a quantum gas apparatus that does evaporative cooling, that is prepares something like a Bose-Einstein condensate, it can take anywhere from say, you know, the record is something like a second, uh, but typical is may, maybe sort of tens of seconds to really prepare that quantum degenerate gas. And then when you're done, you just get one single snapshot because quantum mechanics only gives us one projection of the wave, one projective measurement of the wave function. And then I have to do that many, many times to read out interesting information from my system. So what this means is that if you have a system, uh, uh, an experiment which can operate much faster, in principle, you can much more precisely measure small effects in your system. And so this was very uh, beautifully done for measuring small correlation functions and looking at things like kibble zurich physics in a uh, transverse Ising model. This is data from Misha Lukin's group. Uh, finally, uh, another nice feature of these systems is that uh, 
uh, there's an increasingly large set of possibilities for how uh, you can make these atoms interact and hence entangle them. Uh, so these include Rydberg interactions, which I'll talk about, and which Antoine uh, really did an amazing job going over. Uh, collisional physics, also which Antoine discussed, um, as well as uh, molecules. Such as, so this is uh, more in the context of what uh, June was talking about. Okay, so uh, uh, so far these systems have been applied uh, in a number of different directions. And just to sort of flash some results to give you some context, um, in quantum information processing, these systems have uh, single qubit gates. They're in the sort of like 99.8% level. Um, this isn't a record compared to say trapped ions, but it's very, very good. And it's increasingly getting better. Uh, similarly for um, uh, uh, two qubit gate fidelities in Rydberg qubits, that is to say, qubits formed between a, a long-lived ground state and a short-lived Rydberg state. Um, Bell state fidelities are as high as 99.1%. This is in my uh, colleague's group, uh, Manuel Andres. And then also in hyperfine qubits, so in, that is in, in qubits that are both long-lived, uh, fidelities are as high as 97.4%. So I wanna highlight that while these are actually worse fidelities than what are possible in trapped ion experiments where really people are approaching the sort of error correction regime or the fault tolerant regime. Um, what's amazing about these systems is that you can really scale the many atoms. And so these numbers here, while uh, actually are a, um, uh, a tenfold to 20 fold improvement just over the past five years in the amount of errors that we have. So this is a really accelerating um, uh, field uh, for which there's really like a lot to do. Okay, so in addition to quantum information, there's also a lot of interesting few to many body physics that has been explored in these systems. I won't talk about this in too much detail, but there's been a variety of experiments, including things like few body Hubbard physics, transverse ionizing models, both in ground states and in non-equilibrium, uh, critical phenomena, topological phenomena, generation of large scale entangled states, so like large cap states. Uh, uh, and that's really just a subset. Okay, so <clears throat> getting closer to uh, sort of the subject of this talk, um, sort of one thrust in recent years has really been expanding this, this basic tool set uh, to more complex particles. So one example of that is trapping molecules in tweezers. So rather than uh, uh, trapping ensembles of molecules in an optical lattice, here the goal is to really build up from uh, individual molecules to have a single, uh, single molecule control, for instance, for things like doing gates based on dipolar interactions or looking at the many body physics afforded by dipolar physics. Um, and this is being done uh, at Harvard and John Doyle and Tan Quen Ni's group. And then also there's a new experiment in Lawrence Shook's uh, uh, group at Princeton. Um, so uh, in my group and also in my colleague and friends groups, uh, Manuel uh, Andres and Jeff Thompson at Caltech and Princeton, um, we've really been pushing on this idea of trying to trap alkaline earth atoms in tweezers. Uh, and let me highlight as well that uh, uh, Ben Bloom, who's a, a former Jilla grad student, has a whole company that's devoted to this concept. Um, and that's called Atom Computing. And they are fiercely hiring. So maybe one day you're gonna end up with one of these at this company. Uh, although I guess you're all theorists. Oh, they hire theorists too. They're not all theorists. Okay, we have, oh, we have lots of experimentalists here. Yep. Okay, I'm I'm sorry to offend you by calling you a theorist. Um, no, it was a compliment. Uh, <laughs> um, was someone asking something? Did I hear something else? No. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, good. So, yeah, this is really going to be the focus of the talk. So, uh, here's an outline to sort of my my set of goals here. Um, my time here is good. All right. So first I'm going to tell you about why alkaline earths. I recognize that Ana Maria's talk also began with why alkaline earths. Let me say that this is really why alkaline earths in tweezers. And I'm going to try to motivate why there are features of alkaline, alkaline earths that make them particularly nice for many of the things that we pursue in tweezer systems. Then I'm going to tell you about sort of three vignettes uh, going on uh, at my group at Jilla. And these include looking uh, uh, work that we did in 2019 and 2020, uh, developing the idea of a tweezer clock. Then I'll tell you about recent work in which we've made uh, entanglement on an optical clock transition. Um, this is more in the field of quantum metrology, that is to say, uh, uh, when we seek to use entangled states to improve metrological measurements. Uh, and then finally, I'm gonna completely switch gears and tell you about something different that we've been working on where we use uh, uh, this tweezer technology and the nice cooling that's possible in alkaline earth systems to tweeze single atoms into a Hubbard regime lattice. That is to say, basically uh, 
uh, to operate a quantum gas microscope in reverse. We're taking individual atoms and we're implanting them into the lattice and then we're looking at the resulting Hubbard physics. Uh, good, with that, I'll jump in. Are there any questions before I keep going? Okay. All right, so why alkaline earths? So, um, uh, you know, alkaline earth atoms are two electron atoms, as Anna Maria was saying, uh, and this compares to say single electron atoms. That is to say, electron uh, atoms that have a single electron in their valence shell. So those include things like rubidium, potassium, cesium, lithium, and so on. On the left here in the alkaline earths, we have things like strontium, calcium, magnesium, and then ytter ytterbium is AEA, uh, uh, alkaline earth uh, atom like. Uh, sometimes I'll use this abbreviation AEA because saying alkaline earth atom many times in a row sort of makes your mouth spasm. Um, so uh, uh, why is this additional electron, you know, why do we care? So the first thing is that it means that you have a lot more transitions. Um, and each of these transitions are useful for different aspects of the experiment. Um, compare this to the case of a, of a alkali atom where there's really just one kind of transition possible. It's one of these D1 or D2 lines. And I say one because the line widths of these transitions in the alkaline earths are all different. Um, whereas in the alkalis, you really just have this like one sort of six megahertz scale, roughly wide transition. Um, and, you know, this has been an extremely effective and powerful tool set. And uh, experimentalists began with alkalis because they're so simple to work with and admit such uh, uh, straightforward and effective laser cooling techniques. But of course, you know, one thrust of quantum research in general is, you know, can I harness some slightly more complicated thing? And as a result of that, uh, gain access to new scientific uh, opportunities. And that's really the spirit of these alkaline earth atoms. So let me walk through uh, how uh, each of these transitions that I've labeled here, uh, how they work in the experiment. Uh, and let me add once more, uh, uh, one more thing, which is that uh, in addition to these transitions, uh, as Anna Maria pointed out, the ground state and the, uh, 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 and the triple P zero state in particular, um, have nice, what, what they, they talk to the nuclear spin of these atoms in a very sort of productive and useful way. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so let's first start with this transition here. This is the single S0 to the triplet P1 uh, uh, tr um, level in um, an alkaline earth atom. So the, line, the, the lifetime of this transition is about one to 20 microseconds, depending on the atom that you're working with. And I'm really sort of focusing here in this talk on uh, uh, strontium and uh, ytterbium. So with the laser pointer, I can't actually see the questions because I, um, here, let me switch. Oh, they are. I was just being a little bit, um, uh, uh, I was restricting uh, the discussion here to atoms that have been used so far for a lot of um, uh, cold atom experiments. Uh, thanks for your question. Okay, so why is this why is this transition useful? So one thing that is useful is for doing something known as resolved sideband cooling. So the idea here is that you drive a transition. So so bear in mind that the ground state and the excited state um, both have uh, a harmonic trap associated with it um, as a result of the of a, a tweezer holding on to an atom in these traps. And if I drive a transition that changes the electronic spin, but also reduces the motional uh, quantum number, which is possible in this case because the laser can drive these electronic transitions, but it also can impart momentum. So it talks to the, mo the motion of the atom in the trap. Um, so what I can do is I can reduce the motional quantum number and then the atom decays and it decays in a way that actually preserves that reduced quantum number. And this is because this trap is really tightly confining. So you can sort of think of this as a, the trap is absorbing the momentum associated with the recoil of that emitted photon. Um, and if I do this process over and over, each time reducing the motional quantum, then I can end up with a lot of ground, uh, most of my uh, um, single atom probability as being uh, as accumulating in the motional ground state. So this represents an alternative way of preparing single atoms in their emotional ground state, alternative to say things like evaporative cooling. Uh, and importantly, um, uh, this is possible because the line width of this transition is small compared to the motional spacing between a typical motional oscillator spacing um, in the tweezers. Uh, and in particular, the temperature that you can get to quantified in terms of the average motional quantum number, that depends on the ratio of the line width of this transition to the oscillator frequency. So if you can compare this to say an alkali where gamma here is six megahertz wide, it's very hard in neutral atom systems to make a trap frequency that is an oscillator spacing that is uh, uh, in the megahertz regime. 
Um, there are actually some amazing experiments that have pushed in this regard, such as in Marcus Greiner's lab, where they do sideband cooling of lithium. It helps there a little bit because the lithium is so light, so you can get to high oscillator frequencies quickly. But again, uh, this is typically quite hard to do. So Adam, um, there's another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible to directly go down the motional ladder without coupling to the spin? Uh, uh, no, um, this is sort of subtle. Uh, the reason why is that in order to have a process that um, uh, if you don't have some, uh, so you have an oscillator, right? And if you do couple, if you don't couple it to something nonlinear, then there's no way of preferentially going one direction in your harmonic ladder. I'm just sitting in this discrete space that looks symmetric going down and going up. So if I can't couple to something like a two level system in the process of doing this, then there's no way of breaking time reversal symmetry and end up, and end up going in just one direction. The time reversal symmetry breaking is also coming about from the fact that you're emitting a photon into free space that doesn't come back. But you could do a transition. But let me let me answer this another way. So suppose this transition was infinitely long lived, so that you didn't actually emit a photon. I could uh, drive a transition which would reduce the emotional sideband, and then I could a emotional quantum number, and then I could drive on the carrier and drive back down to here, and then I could do that again, drive it back down to here. The problem is that once I got down to here and I tried to drive in the red sideband to reduce reduce the emotional quantum number, nothing would happen. But then the carrier transition would happen on the second step in that process. So I end up back up here, but then I drive on the red sideband again, and then I end up here. So I just keep going back up the ladder. So on the one hand, you need something that allows you to drive discrete transitions in one direction, say up or down in this harmonic ladder, but then you also need a way of, of breaking time reversal. Um, and that's because you have this photon that emits, that's emitted. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That was a long-winded answer, but I sort of use it as an opportunity to say more. Say it again. Yeah, let's answer the question. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so uh, the key thing here is that you know these transitions sort of represent a sweet spot in the sense that you're narrow enough to get cold. That is, this n bar in steady state is low. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, in the limit of this transition being you know really really long, then the amount of time it would take to cool would be very long because my cooling rate is really capped by how quickly I can scatter photons. That is, how quickly I can remove entropy from my system. Uh, on top of that, this is just super simple. So for an experimentalist, you see something like this, and you're like, oh god, this is just great. Okay, so importantly, if you do these kinds of laser cooling techniques, you can cool an atom to the emotional ground state. Um, uh, what this spectrum here represents is on the left, this is uh, uh, where there would be a peak, or actually, let me start over here. On the right here is a transition where I'm adding a quantum of motion. That is, I'm say going from here to here. Um, and on the left is doing the opposite where I'm removing a quantum of motion. And importantly, when the atom is in the ground state, this transition is suppressed. So the asymmetry between these two transitions allows you to quantify your ground state fraction. Um, and we typically see greater than 90% three-dimensional ground state fraction uh, just by doing this resolved sideband cooling technique. Um, let me highlight as well that there are other methods of cooling that are afforded by these narrow transitions, such as Sisyphus cooling and Doppler cooling. Uh, and I just chose this one because it's a nice one to talk about, but these ones are also really awesome and, use, and used in these outline earth experiments. Okay, so the next thing is that now I can add this other transition here. So in addition to having the cooling transition, I have this transition that I'm calling the detection transition. And I'm calling it that because I can sort of scatter photons arbitrarily fast because five, five nanoseconds is just like a really small number. And importantly, what this means is that I can scatter photons off of this transition, but at the same time, I can cool on this narrow line transition. And what that does is it allows me to hold on to the atoms while scattering a lot of photons. And this allows me to detect the fluorescence from those atoms um, with high fidelity. So these are uh, uh, pictures uh, from uh, my lab at Jilla. Um, I'm showing you on the top single atom histograms uh, of strontium-88 and on the bottom of deuterium-171, uh, both atoms that we trap. Um, and the way to interpret these histograms is on the left here, this corresponds to just sort of our background. When we don't have an atom in the trap, we just, in some region of, of our camera, we just see some background counts due to a variety of things. But on the right, when we do have an atom, uh, there's a shift in this, in the counts that we observe. There's the photons collected and how often we see these number of photons. Uh, and that corresponds to when we have an atom, like I said. And because these two peaks are well separated, we can distinguish the absence or presence of an atom with high fidelity. Uh, good. Um, there's a question, I think. There's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, 
Yeah, so the, the negative numbers are just from the fact that we're doing background subtraction for doing this. That's all. Okay. Uh, can you say uh, yeah. I had a question? So the, I, I'm a little confused about the detection. So you excite the atoms to 1p1? Yep. So you excite the atoms to 1p1 and they, for all intents and purposes, immediately decay back down. Okay. And then you detect that photon, I guess. And then you detect that photon. Um, but when you detect a photon that's associated with a recoil on the atom. So it would heat out of the trap if you didn't have some additional cooling mechanism. And that's what this narrow cooling line uh, allows you to do while you're imaging. But what's the, you know, what's the fidelity of that process? Like how, how often do you lose an atom after your detection? So um, using these narrow line transitions, uh, in all three of our groups, we have been able to see that you can hold on to the atom to a better than a part in a thousand. Oh, okay, so, wow. Yeah. And this was sort of new. Like, uh, I would say it's not obvious that um, this is something intrinsically associated with alkaline earths, mm -hmm. um, but it's only been demonstrated so far in alkaline earths compared to alkalis. Um, I think there are a couple things that are different about our experiments compared to the alkalis um, that would need to be sort of equalized to really do a perfect comparison. And the other question is the 3P0 that uh, June and Ana Maria talked about, so that just for your experiments, that's just not, that's not a transition or level that you care about. Oh, no, no, no. It definitely is. Uh, I'm getting is. there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just sort of, sort of building up. Set it up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, on this point, um, can I ask about uh, the, the ratio? So, so you went after the detection, is it like a one-to-one -one ratio detection cooling? Or is it for every 10 oh, detection? Oh, oh my gosh. No, 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 no. Or? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so a typical scattering rate is one to 10 kilohertz or one to 20 kilohertz. Um, that is the rate at which the atom is emitting photons in this transition. But typically you wanna cool a fair bit faster than that. You wanna be removing energy quickly so that the atom's steady state energy is well below the, the top of the trap. So, so sorry, which one is the, the dominant transition? Uh, the cooling, uh, uh, depending on how efficient the cooling is, let me phrase it in a different way. The amount of energy that you're removing with the cooling needs to be uh, exceed the amount of energy that the atom is acquiring as a result of scattering photons from the detection transition. And you always need to satisfy that inequality. Um, uh, depending on the kind of cooling that you're doing, that will influence the scattering rate needed on the cooling transition. But typically you're gonna to wanna to be in a regime where the cooling scattering rate um, uh, exceeds the detection scattering rate. But sideband cooling, for instance, can be very efficient with respect to the amount of cooling afforded by each photon scattered. So that's why I was try trying to be a little bit careful. So that means the detection takes a relatively long time. If I'm so it takes, um, so in our stratum experiment, we've been as high as 18 milliseconds. Uh, right now we operate um, in a slightly different regime, so it's a little bit longer. In the ytterbium experiment, it's 30 milliseconds. So uh, the way to think about this is as follows. Um, so the scattering rate is about 10 kilohertz. The collection rate, that is the number of the fraction of photons that we collect with our microscope uh, is about 10%. Okay. Um, the NA, so then right? the, the, the count rate on our camera for all intents and purposes up to like factors of like two and pi is about um, uh, uh, a kilohertz, yeah. Okay. Um, so if I need to collect 10 photons, right? Then I need to I need to collect for ten milliseconds. So that's sort of like the rough scale here that you're seeing and why it looks that way. Right. So it's the it's the long lifetime of the cooling transition that limits you in a, in a way. Because the, uh, the electron spends a long time in, in the in the three p one state. Um, twenty microseconds, is, right? Yeah, that's true. It's well, it's it's it's, uh, it's twenty microseconds for strontium, but the cooling is pretty efficient. So you don't need necessarily need to scatter a huge number of photons to cool compared to one photon scattered in the blue. Um, I would say the thing that kills you is the fact that for even very like large microscopes, that is ones that have a very large numerical aperture, um, uh, uh, your collection efficiency is like 10 to 15%. So it just means you're throwing away a lot of light. Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, okay, so let me add a, another thing here, which is that um, uh, the ground state can have nuclear spin. Um, um, and so one thing that we've been working on uh, in particular with Euterbium-171, uh, specifically because it has a spin a half nuclear spin, which means the nuclear spin is this awesome qubit degree of freedom, uh, is controlling it and detecting it. So this is data from literally last week, so it's not particularly pretty. Um, but it's just showing that we're beginning to be able to control this qubit degree of freedom. So these are Rabi oscillations, and we're doing this in a way that we're very sensitive to the thermal motion of the atom, which is why it damps out and has these weird frequency components associated with it. Uh, and then the bottom here are Ramsey oscillations uh, in the spirit of the, of the um, protocol that Anna Marie was talking about, just doing Ramsey interference. Um, and again, this isn't the kind of data that we would ever put in a paper, but I just sort of wanted to illustrate this idea that like we can look at this transition and actually uh, control it and see its coherence. Uh, is someone raising their hand right now? How do you detect the nuclear spin? Like what? How yeah, do you I was sort of glossing over that. So, so basically, um, let's see. I can just let's see if I can draw for a second. Um, so the the ground state actually looks like this because you're in the field or something. Or yeah, you're in a field, but you also have a a tensor shift from the tweezer. Um, and so what we do is we excite this transition, which for this guy is completely off resonance. And so when we excite this transition, it kicks the atom out of the trap. So we can selectively kick out the spin up state as opposed to the down state. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. But that's, that Zeeman splitting is tiny because it's a nuclear spin. Ah, so um, the, Z the Zeeman splitting uh, here is very small. It's 750, uh, Hertz per Gauss, right. but up here it's on the scale of like megahertz per Gauss. Oh, because it involves also the full exactly. J. Yep, because you have a J equals one there. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Clear that. It actually worked. Okay, I was my iPad's like really old and I was worried it was just like not going to work for this. Um, okay, so there was a, a Nung said I thought strontium eighty eight is bosonic. Oh yeah, strontium-88 is bosonic and has no nuclear spin, which is why we're like super excited about using Euterbium-171, which has nuclear spin. Um, but that's a nice segue to this, this, which is um, another transition that we can use is the clock transition, as uh, you guys have heard multiple talks about. Um, and uh, uh, you know this is useful for metrology, but, can you, but you can also think of it as a qubit. And one thing that we uh, have been really pushing on is trying to push the fidelity with which we can control this clock qubit. Um, and these are data uh, from uh, my group where we're just showing uh, Rabi spectroscopy, so varying the clock laser to tuning and Rabi oscillations. And we can get to about 99.1% fidelity contrast with these Rabi oscillations. Um, and this is entirely limited at the moment um, by uh, the small bit of finite motional temperature that we have. Uh, and we can do this for arrays of atoms that are very large. And this is um, combining all these things is actually a bit tricky. Um, so we, we've been happy with this. Um, uh, uh, like the question uh, brought up, this is done with strontium-88 because it doesn't have a nuclear spin. So there's not another qubit degree of freedom. Um, so really one of the few qubit options that you have is just the clock transition itself. But we're also interested in the clock transition because of all its metrological applications. Okay. Adam, so it's yeah. somewhat ignorant question from a non-AMO person, but uh, yeah. you, you know, if you can detect, you know, if you can observe Rabi oscillations just using standard, well, as you described, what is the advantage of complementary advantage of Ramsey fringes measurement versus Rabi oscillation measurement? Is it like one is the you measuring like SZ uh, oscillations and the other is like? X, oh yeah, no, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, there are a couple different ways of answering this. Um, let me first start with um, uh, so from from a metrological standpoint, one thing that you need to be careful of is the probe light shift. The probe light shift is the shift on the clock transition from the clock light itself. Mm -hmm. Now that's not because of the two-level system that you're addressing. It's because that that your atom is a multi-level atom, and so that clock light dresses the ground state and the excited state with a hundred other levels that each shift those two levels differently. Mm -hmm. 
And so that shift needs to be really well controlled, which means that the integrated phase shift from that process, you want to keep as small as possible, which suggests that Ramsey spectroscopy might be a little bit better than Robbie spectroscopy, depending how you're, on how you're doing it. There are actually proposals for trying to reject this using very specific kinds of uh, pulse sequences um, that are sort of in between Ramsey and Robbie. So that, that's that's one thing. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out is that um, uh, doing multiple Robbie oscillations um, can be sensitive to um, uh, uh, emotional effects in a way that a Ramsey sequence is not. I see. Um, yeah, okay. I can go into that in more detail, but that, that is one. Okay, thing. well, fair enough. But uh, would you would you say like they're complementary or? Or... I would say they're used for different things, okay. um, but but in principle, like you can use, you can like they can both be used. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I, I mean, the other thing too is that for for a Ramsey experiment, um, uh, there's this. It's nice that basically the linear, if you're sitting on the side of a Ramsey fringe, you're linearly sensitive uh, uh, to the integrated phase from that process, and hence the frequency of the laser. In a way that's straightforward. Whereas if you're if you're doing this in Robbie spectroscopy, um, you're you're talking about having making your Robbie profile as narrow as possible by integrating your probe for as long as possible, which means you have your clock laser on for a really long time. I see. I see. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that for this work that we're doing, uh, we're using uh, a light from June's lab, and this is a clock laser technology that's been developed over like 20 years. And so just getting to this level of control. Um, uh, takes a lot of work. And there are even commercial options now that get, they're not quite as good as this, but get close to this. Um, and so this just point, this is why I say this is a tough qubit and that you need like a really, really like awesome laser to do it. Okay, so there's actually no way I'm gonna get through all my material today. So that's totally fine. But as just as a warning, I'm gonna skip one section of my talk in the interest of getting to something that potentially is a bit different from what you've heard about so far. Um, so another thing that's nice about the combination of a nuclear spin and a clock degree of freedom is the idea of making a spin orbital exchange gate. Um, so this is related to what Anna Maria was talking about in the sense that the anti-symmetric and symmetric component of the wave function interacts different, differently. So that if you prepare uh, uh, two atoms, one that is E up and one that is G down, where E and G are the electronic degree of freedom and up and down is the nuclear spin degree of freedom, then you actually get an, uh, uh, a coherent beating that changes the populations uh, such that you get E up, G down, coherently oscillating to E down, G up. And so this can allow you to make entangled states in the nuclear spin degree of freedom and hence make two qubit gates. Uh, and this was part of a proposal that actually came out um, from uh, uh, another professor at Rice, Guido Pagano. Um, good. Uh, and, and they were, I should point out, they were really thinking about this in the context of tweezer arrays. Okay, so the next transition that I'm gonna add in here, which of course exists also in alkalis, but uh, uh, there's a sort of twist on it for the alkaline earths, is the existence of a Rydberg transition from the triplet P0 level, so that's the long lived excited clock state, to a Rydberg level. And this is a, in, 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 in most of the experiments that have been done so far in tweezers, this is to a triplet S1 level. Um, now, remember from Antoine's talk, if you were there, these Rydberg levels, if I have two atoms near each other who are both in a Rydberg state, exhibit uh, uh, strong interactions. And so uh, let me just plug in my, um, my uh, I'll just keep going. I'll do that in a second. Um, uh, exhibit strong interactions on the 10 to 100 megahertz scale uh, over distances of about a micron. Uh, so this is really great if you're operating with something like tweezers where you wanna keep the atoms far apart um, uh, or you, you might, for a variety of reasons, one. I want to make them interact for two qubit gates. Those have just connected. Can you guys hear me okay right now? Yeah, you were out for a little bit, but now you're back. Plug in my iPad because it's trying to run out of batteries alarmingly quickly because it was at 50% moments ago. Okay, so these Rydberg transitions are great um, for exactly this process. So uh, uh, in uh, the Andres group at Caltech, uh, they first showed that if you do Rydberg spectroscopy from this triple P0 level to this excited Rydberg level, that you can have very high contrast Robbie oscillations. Um, and what this data here is showing is coherent oscillations between two atoms being in the EE state, that is this triple P0 state, 
Um, and then into the blockaded entangled state of ER plus RE. Um, the reason they go to this state and not to eventually RR is because of these interactions that Antoine was speaking about. So that the simultaneous excitation of both atoms is off resonant with the laser that's driving this process. So you get coherent beating between EE and ER. Um, and sorry, and uh, ER plus RE. Um, and the uh, this realizes a bell state fidelity of 99.1%. Um, the reason it appears that, or one of the reasons it appears that this, this process can be high fidelity is that uh, the excited state, this triple zero state has slightly better overlap with the triple S1 state, which means you can get to higher Rabi frequencies with a given amount of power, which makes you much more um, uh, uh, resilient against various forms of technical noise that, that typically arise in these experiments. But this is a, a, a technical thing. It's not necessarily a fundamental one. Uh, and furthermore, another nice thing that's possible is to photo ionize these atoms to improve the uh, detection of the Rydberg state. Okay, so one thing I wanted to highlight is that uh, in addition to applications in, in quantum information, having such high fidelity Rydberg interactions is also important for many body physics. So um, uh, Antoine in his talk discussed the idea of doing adiabatic uh, sweeps of a many body Hamiltonian across a, an Ising phase transition. So I'm showing you a picture here on the top of starting with some square array and then going into some uh, uh, final ground state, which is a checkerboard configuration of the atoms uh, being in G, where the red G and R, where the red corresponds to an atom being in R. Um, this is uh, data from um, a recent paper from Misha Lukens group. Uh, on the bottom left here corresponds to uh, a histogram of the number of possible outcomes of the spin distribution. And you can see here, there are these two outliers of the two possible ground state configurations of the atom, of the atoms. Um, and importantly, uh, if you look in this, uh, I think it's actually in the main part of the paper, um, the ground state probability, that is the likelihood that you prepare these states, um, gets worse and worse as the system size gets larger and larger. That's sort of what you expect for many body systems with finite uh, errors in your preparation with a slope that goes like 0.97 to the N. And this 0.97 here is the fidelity of the Rydberg excitation process. Um, so by having a, a higher fidelity uh, Rydberg excitation um, uh, scheme, you can actually improve the fidelity with which you prepare a many body state. Okay, are, are there new questions here? I can't tell. No, good, okay. All right, so the next thing, um, which and this was done in, in Jeff Thompson's group at Princeton, um, is these Rydberg atoms can be trapped by the tweezer in a way that's not possible in alkalis. So in an alkali, and this is just sort of interesting atomic physics, so I wanted to describe it. So in an alkali, you, when you excite the electron uh, uh, to a Rydberg level, um, the remaining core is inert. It can't really respond to a laser or polarize in an interesting way. Whereas in an alkaline earth atom, uh, I have an electron that's still in, in the um, uh, that's still in the core. So uh, if I want to sort of get back to say Chris Monroe's talk, if I have ytterbium 171 neutral and I excite it to a river level, the remaining core looks exactly like Chris Monroe's ytterbium 171 ion. And that is an ion that looks like something that has a single electron in its valence shell, which means that it can polarize. And this has really important implications because in an alkali, the only way of trapping the, the atom when it's in a Rydberg state is via the ponder motive effect. This is just the, the interaction potential that a charged particle sees uh, in an oscillating in a homogeneous electric field. Um, whereas in an alkaline earth, uh, you have both this ponder motive effect and you have the fact that the core polarizes. And so this was really beautifully illustrated in this work from Jeff, where they show that as you go up and up in quantum number, which is to say your Rydberg state gets more and more spread out. So your, your Rydberg um, electron gets to be sort of basically outside the regime of the tweezer. That's where this green is. As you get more and more out, the potential looks to look, begins to look more and more like the potential experienced by just the core. And so you can really trap the Rydberg atom for an alkaline earth atom in the same tweezer that's used to trap the ground state. And this is related to ideas uh, uh, or can be extended to related ideas in, in clock physics where you try to magic trap that is symmetrically trap the ground state and the Rydberg state. Um, and it's very hard to do things like this in an alkali. 
So um, uh, the upshot of this work is that as you went to higher and higher principal quantum number, the lifetime of the trapped Rydberg level got better and better. And this is great because it means you can really start to begin to use uh, uh, this longer lifetime for, uh, for quantum science applications. So for instance, uh, Antoine was discussing uh, uh, um, uh, an experiment that they did where they were looking at topological physics, where the qubit in their experiment was encoded in both Rydberg degrees, in, in, where both qubit states were in Rydberg states. That is to say you have a Rydberg, the 60S a half state and the 60P a half state as your down and up state. Uh, and this allowed them to look at things like dipolar exchange and to make a bosonic SSH model. Um, but importantly, the length of the quantum simulation will depend on how, of this kind of quantum simulation rather, depends on how long the atoms will stick around for, which means having this extra electron means that you can do a longer quantum simulation because the atoms will, will remain trapped for a longer period of time. Adam? Uh, I, I'll, I'll get, let me just finish this one point. And then the other thing is that um, uh, because of the asymmetric trapping of the ground in the Rydberg state, in a lot of two cubic gate experiments with Rydberg atoms, people actually flash off the traps so that they don't have to worry about the asymmetric shift, uh, sorry, the shift on the, on the Rydberg transition from the tweezer itself. And if you do that many, many times, you actually heat up the atom. And so in this case, you would not have to do that. Okay, there was a question here. Yeah, Garrett, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, so I have a question. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question about the, um, I guess the point you made earlier about how the principal quantum number, as the principal quantum number increases, then the yeah. lifetime of the Rydberg state increases. So I thought, so did you say earlier that the, the high fidelity between the 3P0 and the N3S1 was due to the wave function overlap between those two states? Um, I said that the you have an increase in Rabi frequency because the the dip dipole matrix element between triple P zero and triple S one is slightly higher, which is because the triple P zero state is slightly bigger than the ground state in a manner that enhances this dipole matrix element. But you're not changing anything about the Rydberg level, which is always just large. Oh, yeah. Is that clarified? Yes. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay. So. Um, uh, uh, the TLDW, if you will, which is uh, too long, didn't watch, uh, is, uh, you know, these alkaline earth systems have a lot of new technical capabilities that in and of themselves, I would say, are actually sort of minor advances, but altogether, uh, uh, you have just like this platform that can do a lot of things well. Um, so it's it's been useful as a vehicle for a lot of different physics as a result, uh, just in this past sort of three to four year period. Okay, so my group, as I, I've sort of foreshadowed already, has two experiments. So one is in strontium and the other is in ytterbium. Um, the strontium experiment focuses on strontium-88 at the moment, which is a bosonic isotope, which does not have nuclear spin. Uh, the ytterbium experiment focuses on ytterbium-171. That is to say an atom that does have spin. And, and as I mentioned, it has a spin of a half, which is really nice. And so each of these platforms are useful for a variety of directions in quantum science. Uh, and what I'm gonna focus on in my talk today and, and talking about my work, so I have about 40 minutes here, which actually I think is pretty good, um, is uh, experiments that we did uh, looking at the idea of a tweezer clock. Then I'm gonna talk about uh, 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 trying to make entangled states on the optical clock transition. Um, and then I'll describe um, some recent stuff that we've been doing and new approaches to Hubbard physics. So uh, before I delve into these things, let me just like briefly just show you what our experiment looks like. So this is a, a so-called CAD drawing of our experiment. We have a microscope. It sits on this plate here, which is stabilized to our, our, our vacuum chamber. Um, this whole thing, we want to be extremely monolithic because there are many different laser beams that we want to be phase stable with respect to one another. So for instance, this plate here allows us to make an optical lattice, the fringes of which are stable with the positions of the optical tweezers. Um, on the right here is a picture of the actual experiment. That blue thing is actually a magneto optical trap, so a cold cloud of strontium atoms. Um, and these are images actually from a little bit ago where we take fast images of single atoms um, in these tweezers. On the right is a stochastically that is a randomly filled array. On the left is an average image over many runs of the experiment. Okay, so the way that we make the tweezers in our experiment, um, we use acousto-optic deflectors. These are devices where you shine an electric, or yeah, I guess you can say you shine, you shine an electrical signal into the acousto-optic device. Um, it makes a, a, a grating within a crystal, which then 
uh, deflects the light by a variable angle, which depends on the frequency of the signal that you're putting into the AOD. So this gives you the ability to control the, the, the amplitude and angle uh, of a beam that's deflected by the acousto-optic deflector. And if you put in many such electrical signals, then you get many such deflections. Um, and if you do this in two axes, you get a comb of, of, of deflections in both one axis and then another axis. And then when that goes through a microscope, it makes an array of spots like these here. Uh, and we use fast uh, custom electronics to really make this um, uh, low noise and fast. Um, another thing that we do, um, uh, although we haven't actually integrated this into the experiment yet, is uh, we use a spatial light modulator for shaping the wave front of the light that can go into the microscope. Um, and this is nice because it gives you a bit more arbitrary control. Um, and this, this project was actually um, put together by uh, a visiting student from Bonn, Felix Ronchen, who, uh, who is fantastic. Um, and so this allows you to make really more arbitrary configurations of the tweezers. And because the atoms live at the location of the tweezers, this means you have like really tailored many body physics. Um, you can even do this in 3D, as was shown in uh, Antoine's group a little bit ago, they actually made an Eiffel Tower. Um, and this, this camera, this video here is just showing you as you scan through the direction of the tweezers, these atoms come into focus at two locations. So you can think about making uh, coupled layers in that way. Okay, so with that, I'm going to jump into this first sort of vignette that I wanted to get to. Um, are there any questions about the sort of technology that I sort of just very quickly went through? Okay, so let me begin here by asking the question, why would we want to make a tweezer clock? So um, as Ana Maria and June both have discussed, you know, atomic clocks rely uh, just like any, like, like, they operate like all clocks do. They rely on some regular periodic effect. Uh, in the case of atoms, this effect I like to think of is just the uh, the evolution of a superposition on the block sphere. So I have some block vector. The relative phase between the ground state and the excited state has some uh, 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 phase phi, which evolves at the energy difference between the ground and the excited state. So that's the oscillator frequency of this oscillator. Um, and importantly, the lifetime of this superposition upper bounds the quality factor of the isolator, the, uh, of the oscillator. That is to say, how many times this thing can coherently oscillate. Um, so an important thrust in a lot of clock um, experiments is to make the, uh, the systems coherent for as long as possible. Um, so uh, an atomic clock uh, operates by stabilizing a laser, some uh, uh, um, oscillator, um, a continuous oscillator in time, uh, to some cavity, but this cavity, uh, it can drift in time due to a variety of environmental perturbations. So we use the atoms to stabilize the laser so that we have this continuous oscillator that we can sample because we can't continuously sample the atoms because when we detect them, we typically lose them. Um, so the stability of this overall architecture, which uh, 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 is specifically the amount of precision that you accrue as a function of averaging time, that is how long you uh, implement this architecture for and measure um, uh, the laser with respect to the atoms. Um, that stability uh, depends on both the quality factor, which is why it's so important to make the atoms very high frequency and also very long lived, um, or the oscillator rather very long, um, very high frequency and very long lived. Uh, and further, it depends on the number of atoms that you have. Um, because you have many independent things which are independently collapsing. So it's like flipping and coins and you'll have a Poisson distribution and the resulting expectation value. Um, good. The other thing that's important is this effect known as the Dick effect. I'm not gonna say too much about this, but I do wanna highlight it because it really, it gets an important feature of the tweezer systems and why we would wanna explore them. This is the fact that the laser has random phase excursions on it which uh, might be high frequency with respect to the cycle time of my experiment. Um, but because I'm only stroboscopically sampling the atoms, because I'm spending some time detecting the atoms, sometimes preparing the atoms, um, uh, that noise gets aliased down into the time domain of the experiment and compromises the amount, the, the ideal stability that you might otherwise um, uh, uh, expect. Um, and so this is actually a real limitation in lattice clocks because you can have many atoms, but this dick effect noise can really be a problem. And so one way of dealing with this is by making better and better lasers and better and better reference cavities. Another way is by getting to higher and higher duty cycle. That is to say, eliminating this dead time where the laser is randomly wa uh, uh, wandering and you're not sampling the atoms. 
Um, so this suggests that my wish list for these experiments are many atoms, long coherence times, and high duty cycle. Um, and let me point out that in this context, the existing leading platforms sort of um, uh, are on opposite sides. So you have trapped ions, which are just a single ideal quantum sensor, um, which can be interrogated at very high duty cycle. But the challenge here is that you're limited, uh, uh, limited by the, the quantum projection noise of just a single ion, which means I need to run my experiment many times in order to get sufficient precision. On the other hand, we have optical lattice clocks about which you've already heard much about. You know the story here. You have thousands of atoms, but they can collide, they can tunnel. These are all things that you need to control. Um, but this enhancement in the number of atoms that you have improves the precision. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So what we're thinking about here is something that sort of threads the needle between these two. It is a compromise along uh, this number coherence duty cycle axis. Um, so in 2019, we, we did an experiment uh, in collaboration with June's group. And one of the reasons uh, that this collaboration was so important was that we had no idea how long the coherence time would be for an atom and a tweezer. There are a variety of things that might affect it. But one of the things that we were really um, encouraged by were experiments done in the lattice community, which showed that if you have single atoms per trap, so per lattice site, the coherence time got much longer. And so by using um, this, this amazing laser from June's lab, we could really be sure that we would just be limited by the coherence time of the atoms and not the coherence time of the laser itself. And so what we were able to see is that we had three seconds of atom laser coherence. Um, we could ex uh, interrogate the atoms at high duty cycle. So as high as 96%, this is actually a, a record for these kinds of systems. Um, and we could have decent stability. That is to say, um, the, the rate at which we accrue precision. Um, this number here is about a factor of 10 worse than what had been reported at the time for lattice clocks. Um, this points to wanting more atoms. And in uh, work that came just short, uh, shortly afterward, uh, this is a beautiful experiment from Manuel's group where they were able to go to 40 atoms, but they were operating at shorter interrogation times. So these, all of these results together point to the idea of whether you can make larger systems while still maintaining quantum coherence. That is to say, can we have a large system and be able to interrogate it on long times? Yep. Um, so in those experiments you just showed us, are you in the emotional ground state in all three directions or? Uh, two directions for this experiment. And then the experiment I'm about to describe, three directions. So, I mean, does that, does that play an important role in limiting the coherence? How cold do you need to be? Um, it's a, so you want to be cold along the, if, if, you're, if you're magic and if, if your trap is like dead on magic, then uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, you don't care that much about the, uh, the emotional effects. Um, but if you're too hot, then uh, you can't drive coherent Rabi oscillations. And I'm actually gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, okay, so the next thing that we did was we tried to come to sort of get at this question by combining multiple different wavelengths of tweezers. So we have a 515 nanometer tweezer array. Um, the, the thing that's important about this tweezer array or this wavelength is it's great for loading many traps and for doing ground state cooling. Um, and we can do decent detection in it. Um, and the 813 nanometers, th that's the wavelength that's magic for the clock transition as you've already heard about and so, for strontium. And so that means that we can coherently interrogate the transition for long periods of time and without systematic shifts using that wavelength. But the polarizability, that is to say how much power is needed to get to a given depth is horrendous at this wavelength. So what that means is that it'd be great if you could uh, uh, have the 813 nanometer shallow, that is very little power per trap for the whole experiment. Um, and then all the sort of expensive, uh, sort of power expensive parts of the experiment are done with the 515. And that's exactly what this combination allows us to do. So we load the tweezers in 515, we do all the preparation, and then we losslessly load them into the 813 nanometers where we do clock spectroscopy. Then we load them back into the 515 to detect the atoms. So that's the basic architecture. And the key point is this allowed us to increase our sample size by a factor of 30. We could do three dimensional ground state cooling in all directions. Uh, the atoms lived in these traps for one to two minutes. Uh, and the fundamental coherence time that we'd expect, including all effects associated with dissipation in the experiment, is about a minute, it's 55 seconds. Um, and so we set about trying to see whether we can see that coherence time. And so we do this typical Ramsey experiment that Anna Maria uh, already discussed. So I'll just fly through it. Um, and here's what we saw. So I'm showing you here the measured triple P0 fraction as a function of Ramsey dark time. And I'm first just showing you the envelope of the fluctuations um, in the measured triple P0 fraction. This light gray here corresponds to our expectation of this envelope decay from 
just the loss out of the trap and decay of the triplet P0 state. Um, this dark gray here corresponds to the combination of the light gray curve and um, dephasing phenomena that I'll describe in a moment um, that we know exist in these experiments. And this dark gray here corresponds to the length of time for which the atoms remain coherent with the laser. And that might be confusing because you'd think that these would decay at that rate then. Um, but importantly, that's not what happened because happens because the atoms remain coherent with one another. Let me flesh out what that means. So on the left here, these are oscillations in uh, uh, at short times, and you can see that both there's a well-defined fringe and the, this this fringe is high contrast, which is to say there's well defined there's a well-defined relative phase between the atoms and the laser, but that also all of the atoms are responding the same way to the laser, which is to say that there's also atom atom coherence. All of the dipoles that we've excited are oscillating with the same phase. At 20 seconds, we that fringe is gone. So that is to say, we've lost the relative phase between the atoms and the coherent and the laser, but there's still atom-atom coherence, which is to say the dipoles themselves are still aligned with one another. And then at late times, we've lost atom-laser coherence and we've lost atom-atom coherence, which is manifest both in the suppression of these fluctuations and the suppression of an, uh, uh, a fringe. Um, and so we can we can look with our single site observables at these correlations in the individual block vectors of the atoms. Um, it looks like there's a question, so maybe I'll answer it before I explain this data. So the question from Garrett is, is this the difference between decoherence and dephasing? Um, by this, do you mean, uh, mm, I wouldn't put it that way. I would say this is an example of a difference. Um, uh, so if I lose, if I lose a, a photon to the environment by scattering a photon, um, and that photon carries information about whether I was in, say, the ground or the excited state, um, that leaves my atom in a statistical mixture rather than something that has a phase shift. Um, so in that sense, there's a relationship because if you have if you emit a photon in the environment, then the atoms would not retain atom-atom coherence. Um, but I would say that the difference between de decoherence and dephasing is more subtle than like, or is, is more general than the specific physical phenomena that I'm describing right now. Um, Maybe to, to explain that a little bit more. So I can have atom laser def uh, dephasing where the, ad the individual atoms are still in pure states. They haven't, uh, they haven't uh, interacted with some unmeasured degree of freedom. Um, I can even have atom-atom dephasing uh, that also arises from that process. And that's actually exactly what I'm about to describe. So what we can look at here um, is the correlations in the um, uh, in the SZ projection um, as a function of time of the individual atoms. So I'm plotting here this G2 correlator um, as a function for different snapshots in time. Um, and there, these are uh, uh, plotted in this two-dimensional plot with um, the X and Y axis shown here, which is just like the position in the array. Um, and importantly, um, at late times, if you're looking at my pencil right now, um, if I'm looking at the the x y projection of the block sphere, I don't know why I drew x and y that way, but it's fine. Then, um, oh no, my uh, my okay. Um, then on random runs of the experiment, um, the block vector might be pointing in a random direction. Yeah, but importantly, if I'm rotating about a fixed axis in the rotating frame of the laser, then if I'm orthogonal to that axis, then all of the atoms will rotate up with respect to that laser or down, which means their correlations in the classical correlations, not quantum correlations, in the response of the atoms to that laser, which we can read out in this correlation function. Uh, and importantly, at late times, we observe that there's actually anti-correlation um, in their response. And that's because when the block vectors uh, in the corners are, the block vectors in the corners are dephasing in, a, in a, uh, a well understood way with respect to those atoms in the center of the array. And actually what we're resolving here are millihertz scale shifts between the transition frequency on the corners of our array compared to the center of our array. 
And this is because the tweezers are each at different optical frequencies, which means we can't simultaneously satisfy the magic condition for all of the, the tweezers. So we get small shifts in the transition frequency for the atoms. Um, okay, so the upshot of these, of these measurements was that we could actually get to an ensemble coherence time of about 20 seconds, a single particle coherence time of 48 seconds, and that's including loss, so that you should compare that to that 55 second number, which it's consistent with. And then if you actually just exclude loss and just ask the question, how long is the oscillator well defined for? There's actually uh, 92 seconds. Um, and so um, uh, these are really sort of a record for these kinds of experiments. So um, uh, uh, this shows sort of how the tweezer system can serve to sort of dissect the microscopics of clocks. Uh, Furthermore, by having many atoms in long coherence time, we could get to having much higher stability. And basically, even though we were operating with 10 times fewer atoms, we were matching the stabilities uh, uh, reported at that time. Uh, these stabilities have gotten even 10 times better. So I would say that uh, uh, you know, these systems are, are sort, of, sort of learning from each other. Uh, you know, we learned from the, the, the tweezers, the lattice systems, that if we had single atoms per site, our coherence time would be much longer. Um, but then when we learned about how the various dephasing mechanisms arise in our tweezers, that actually informed the next generation of 1D lattice clocks in June's experiments. Um, and so this has really been a nice back and forth. So it uh, looks, looks like there's a question. Allen deviations never saturating on those time scales? Is that expected? Or um, and will it saturate, I guess? Yeah, yeah, this is a really good question. So these are relative frequency comparisons. So what we're doing here is we're comparing the, the, the frequency of one side of our sample compared to the frequency of the other side of our sample. And we're asking the question, how precisely can we know that number as a function of averaging time? Um, so provided you don't, so, so what this does is it rejects laser noise, which is a typical reason why this, this Allen deviation would plateau. Um, you still will get plateauing at really, really long averaging times, but 10 to the four seconds is a long time already. So uh, yeah, I think question. there was another question here. Oh, I, I think I saw it. Was this, uh, so it said, should I think of the AOD shifts? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, I sort of glossed over that. Um, but yep, that's exactly right. So the AOD gives rise to uh, megahertz scale differences in the optical frequency of the tweezers. Um, and uh, that gives rise to a slightly different AC Stark shift on the clock transition, which is exactly what we're resolving. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yeah, does, sure. Does, does that mean that the micromirrors should make that better because you're not imparting? Awesome. This? Yep, that's exactly right. Yes. Okay. If you use, yep, yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So, okay. So I'm going to switch gears here. So um, there's a big thrust in the sort of metrology and quantum metrology community, and that is to engineer entanglement in a clock. Um, uh, these systems, I'll explain why in a moment, but these systems that I've been describing are nice for this because they combine one, stable long-lived clocks, like I've been talking about, and two, uh, various methods for generating entanglement among the atoms. So for instance, I'm showing here uh, an experiment from Misha's uh, uh, group where they're able to make a GHZ state of a superposition of GR, GR, GR plus R, GR, GR, G, and so on. Um, and these are the kinds of entangled states you might be interested in in the metrological context. Uh, context except these are on the ground Rydberg transition. So we really wanna make these states in the clock degree of freedom, right? Instead of GR, 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 we wanna make EG, EG, EG plus G, E, G, E, G, E, or all E plus all G. Okay, so um, there are various methods for, that are being explored for doing this. So one, um, oh, sorry, I left my, my, my drawings here. Um, uh, one is uh, using cavities and the collective interaction between the atoms in a cavity and the, um, uh, the light field within that cavity. I'm not going to talk about that, but this is a very fruitful direction that gives you a specific kind of entangled state. Uh, and there are other kinds of entangled states that are being explored also with these systems. Um, uh, what we're looking at is really trying to combine all of the sort of programmability that you have in a tweezer system to engineer much more uh, arbitrary quantum states based on the output of some circuit or some uh, analog, analog dynamics that you're controlling uh, with, within the context of this system. Um, and so what this means, uh, looks like my slides actually got a little mixed up here. So, well, whatever. Um, uh, why would you wanna do this? Why would you wanna engineer entanglement in a clock context? So let's compare uh, two cases. So if I have many uncorrelated two-level systems, that is to say a product state of all atoms pointing along the x-direction of the block sphere, let's contrast that with the case of 
uh, a superposition of all atoms being in the ground state and all atoms being in the excited state. So in this latter case, the energy difference for my oscillator, where now my oscillator is this entangled state, that oscillator has an n times larger energy difference, right? This is just because the top part of my wave function is occurring phase n times faster compared to the product state case, where the difference in energy between all the spins is always just omega, the energy difference between ground and excited. So I have an n times larger energy difference, which is my Q is n times higher, which sounds great. The problem is that the system also decays n times faster, right? If I emit, if any one of my atoms, say, emits a photon to the environment, then the whole thing is, is kaput. It decays and I have no interesting phase information. So um, what that means is that if, you, if your interrogation in a clock is limited by your atomic coherence, then for a state like this, a GHG state, um, the entanglement is, 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 use, is, is not useful to you because your, your stability is not improved. Your Q goes, gets better, but your, N, um, sorry, your, uh, uh, your interrogation time gets small. Sorry, I said this wrong. The Q, which depends on both the coherence time and the frequency of the transition in your oscillator, um, those two things get scaled by the exact same amount, but in the opposite direction. So your Q ends up being unchanged. So while you'd first think, oh, I have an n times larger energy difference, hence my Q gets n times better, um, it also decays n times that faster. So its width is n times larger, hence my Q is unchanged. But if you're in a regime where your interrogation is not limited by at atomic coherence, that is to say, very much in the regime that I've been talking about, where we have these very long atomic coherence times, then there's a wide class of lasers that you can stabilize with these entangled states. Um, there are many other subtleties to this process, but I just sort of wanted to sort of highlight this particular one. Okay, so what we've been doing, and maybe I'll go, actually, I'm okay on time. I probably just won't get to the end of my talk, and it's fine. Um, you make sure really, to leave some time for questions. Okay, I, I was wondering whether there were a lot during the talk, so I could sort of push till 1230. Is that not the case or no? Yeah, I think it'd be good to leave at least five minutes at the end for questions. Usually oh, five minutes I can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what we've been doing is trying to engineer a tool set for coherently controlling the clock transition as if it was a qubit in large arrays of atoms and also have a good two qubit gate in the system. And so uh, uh, the way we've been doing this is by interfacing our tweezers with an optical lattice potential. The key point of the optical lattice is as follows. So the first thing is that being able to image individual atoms at high fidelity uh, uh, is just a lot easier in the lattice when you're getting to more and more atoms. It's just more efficient with respect to optical power, especially when you're in, at a wavelength which is, has a low polarizability. So this is quite nice in, uh, uh, in that now we can do basically the equivalent of quantum gas microscopy for strontium. Um, this is in a Harvard regime lattice where the spacing between the lattice sites is about 568 nanometers. Uh, the images are a bit longer, although we keep them as short as possible, which is why it almost looks a little grainy here. But importantly, um, it's in a regime where we have less than a percent loss and our fidelity is much less than 1%. Um, yep, yeah, it looks like there's a question. Oh, uh, I was going to ask. Um, oh, 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 yeah. If the experiment is limited by atom laser coherence, then then it's a win. I see. And um, so because you, you can think of it as follows: like I can I can I can integrate phase for a shorter amount of time, but I have a gain in the size of that signal. I see. But uh, wouldn't you also pick up um, the laser noise at n times the rate? Yeah, so you'd, you'd integrate for less time, but for that same shorter amount of time, uh, you have a larger phase excursion compared to the product state case, which means that your stability is higher. I see. Okay. Does that make sense? It's sort of actually sort of subtle, but does, it, does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, the next thing is that we can do ground state cooling along all three dimensions in these traps. These are the sideband spectroscopy that I was showing you earlier. Um, this 90% number you see a lot. The reason why is that it's just the limit of our, of our thermometry um, uh, precision. So we just sort of spec it based on what we can say. Uh, importantly also, and these are the data that I was showing you earlier, we can do um, high fidelity clock rotations now in this lattice. The reason why it's possible to do it with many um, atoms now is that you need tightly confining traps to do high fidelity clock rotations because of the momentum kick. Um, and it's just hard to make many deep tweezers in the same uh, with sufficient confinement compared to using a lattice like this. Um, and this is, you know, our previous work was at 80%. 
uh, fidelity, and that's because the traps were shallow and we were outside of the lambda key regime, if you're familiar with that. Um, okay, so this whole thing is compatible with about 3,000 Lambda sites uh, uh, for this for all these parameters that I'm showing you here. Okay, so the next thing we want to do here is, is a two qubit gate. And so what we do is we implant the atoms in the lattice in a particular configuration using the lattice. So this is an averaged image. So we're still randomly filling our array, but we're only filling the atoms at these sites that you're seeing here on average. So these are arrays of doublets. And our, our goal here is to do two qubit gates among the atoms in these doublets. Uh, and we're going to use Rydberg states to do that. Um, uh, uh, we can do Rabi oscillations on the Rydberg transition. This is sort of a technical point, um, but this is sort of analogous to the data I was showing you earlier. This dashed gray line here corresponds to our Rydberg detection fidelity. As I mentioned earlier, um, this can be improved by uh, doing photo ionization, um, but we're actually not interested in doing uh, excited Rydberg physics. Um, so we don't really care about our ability to detect the Rydberg level because we want all of our population to be back in the ground state manifold when we're done. You probably said this, which Rydberg state? This is the triplet S1 state. Sorry, I should have said that. I, I, I didn't say that here. I said it earlier, but not here. Um, uh, okay, so here's how we... Uh, uh, for, for, for what in? Sorry, uh, th this data is all for N equals 40. Um, so um, these next couple of slides are going to explain how we do our gate. Um, so we have this three-level system. We have the clock transition and we have the Rydberg transition. So let's now imagine I have this Rydberg drive on and it's detuned by some amount delta. So the shift on the excited state from that process, let's just consider that for the moment, um, looks like this. This is just the AC Stark shift on the excited state from a two level system driven with a Robert frequency omega uh, and with some detuning delta, okay? So if I have a two particle state, uh, uh, the shift on that two particle state where the atoms uh, are say in GE or EG, so the index here corresponds to um, I have two atoms separated in space. I'm telling you about this, the, the clock state of uh, uh, the atom on the left or the atom on the right. Uh, so the shift on that state is exactly the single particle light shift. Now let's add in uh, um, if I have both the atoms in the excited state. So if you recall from Antoine's talk, the Rabi frequency from the, from the excited, for two atoms in the excited state to the Rydberg state has a root two enhancement in the Rabi frequency. And this is because there are two paths that can take me to this plus state, which is the GR plus RG state. And so I get coherent enhancement in uh, that Rabi frequency, that matrix element. Um, and importantly, I cannot go up to the RR state, right? Because that's out of resonance as a result of the interaction between the atoms. So that means that the, the light shift, the two particle light shift that is on the EE state, it actually looks like this where I have this two omega squared here versus an omega squared here. And so the difference between this two particle light shift and twice the single particle light shift is the amount of, uh, 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 of differential phase that I accrue for entanglement for this process. Because if these atoms were far apart, then I would have twice the single particle light shift. That's just sort of like the product state limit of this. Um, and so we use that in a two qubit gate and we do it as follows. We have a ramp of our, of our Rydberg laser. I'll describe why we do that ramp in a moment. We do a pi pulse that we flip the ground state to the excited state, and so that it can, too can accrue a phase. And by doing that, that allows us to make an SD squared interaction. That is a phase gate, which imp, uh, where a phase is imparted to the atoms, depending on whether on the relative alignment of their spin. Um, uh, I'll say this again later, but by sandwiching this between two pi over two pulses, um, that changes this SZ squared inter interaction into an SX squared interaction. Okay, so I, I alluded to this, this fact that we do a ramp. Here's how why we do a ramp. So the dominant decay of the, so the, the, the dominant error here is the decay out of the Rydberg state. The decay out of the Rydberg state depends on the probability that you're in the Rydberg state, which is the ratio of omega squared over delta squared. Um, whereas the interaction strength that is the rate at which you accrue energy here, entangle, or you might call it entangling energy, goes like omega to the fourth over delta cubed. So uh, uh, based on a really nice protocol from Ivan Deutsch's group, what we do is we ramp the Rydberg laser on resonance with, with uh, um, the Rydberg transition. We wait some amount of time T1, and then we ramp it off resonance. And by doing that, by bringing the atoms 
onto resonance, we're improving the ratio of these two uh, of the interaction scale to the decoherence time scale. Um, these are showing you that basically you can do this process and return all of the population back to the Rydberg level. I mean, sorry, back to the ground state. Um, and that's what this green here is showing. Um, and uh, you can also calculate that the infidelity for this process can be as low as 5%, so about a 95% Bell state fidelity. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so we can see this in, see the, these dynamics in our data as expected. So as I said, this gives rise to an SX squared interaction. So if we prepare both our atoms in the, in the excited state, um, and then we are sorry in the ground state and we look at oscillations in total SC, this is what we observe. And you can see that um, at uh, say times here, all of the atoms that started in doublets end up being in that excited state. That means all the atoms are, are, are responding to the, um, all the atoms in the, both atoms in the doublets are having a correlated response to the laser. So you're getting a two particle rotation from GG to EE, but you're not populating states like EG or GE along the way. Um, the envelope of this decay uh, in our process corresponds to the failure of our spin echo. And it's actually remarkable that this works at all because you're parting enormous light shifts on the single atoms and this spin echo can reject a lot of it. This pink here corresponds to our leakage out of the PEE plus PGG manifold. Uh, and this comes about because of the failure of the spin echo, like I was saying. Um, so at these times here where SZ crosses zero, we expect that we make a state like this, where we, where we have GG plus EDI theta EE. And so to really know that you have entanglement in the system, it's insufficient to just look at the populations and say, oh, I'm getting GG, oh, I'm getting E. Because uh, even if it's, there's an equal likelihood of getting both, you don't know that there's a well-defined relative phase between those two components. And so there's a nice prescription for measuring that, and that's to do something known as parity oscillations. And so by applying a pi over two pulse to this GG plus E to the I theta EE state, you end up with something that looks like GE plus EG whenever theta is an integer multiple of two pi. Um, uh, conversely, when that's not the case, and you have, say, an odd integer for theta, um, uh, then you end up with something that looks like GG plus EE, which is to say the likelihood that the atoms are in the same state versus different states, and that's exactly what this parity number is quantifying, should oscillate as a function of phase theta. And so we, what we see is exactly this, and this allows us to certify that we have phase coherence between the GG and EE components on this optical clock transition. Um, maybe I'll skip that for now. Um, and importantly, we see that the Bell state fidelity that we can do with this is about 89%. So this matches the best results seen so far in 2D, but is worse than what's been possible in 1D. And we're in the process of figuring out what our errors are here. Um, but importantly, you know, we really care about using this, this um, uh, for metrology applications. So if we vary the whole time between the generation of the Bell state and the tomography pulse for looking at the parity, we can actually get a signal that's useful because um, it integrates the relative phase between the GG and EE component. And importantly, we see that provided we arrange for things to be in the right conditions, we can have uh, uh, 400 milliseconds of, of, of relative phase coherence between the Bell state and the laser. Um, and actually just yesterday we improved this, but we haven't taken this further. We figured out um, some uh, thorny effects that were hurting our single particle coherence time, but we've now uh, determined those and those are getting a bit better. Um, okay, um, so on the horizon here for these systems, we're doing metrology with Bell states, uh, looking at ideas like combining um, uh, uh, Ising models with um, global rotations to really optimize the amount of entanglement that you have in these systems. This is based on a collaboration with Peter Zoller's group, uh, which they've since extended to other ideas that are quite interesting. Um, we're also collaborating with Ana Maria's group. Um, looking at how uh, the dynamics of transverse realizing models can also help to promote entanglement, uh, useful for metrology. Okay, um, I'm at 12.25 here. Let me just say like one minute about this and then I'm gonna stop. So we have this new thing that we're doing um, where we tweeze single atoms into a lattice and maybe just as like, uh, uh, um, what's the term? I forget the term, Never mind. Um, so the atoms do like a quantum walk in this lattice when we tweeze single atoms into the lattice, right? So you should see like coherence uh, uh, um, uh, spreading of the wave function on the lattice. Um, and so what this looks like is we tweeze a single atom to the center of our lattice. That's where that black circle is. And then we take many runs of the experiment 
and we accrue a probability density distribution associated with that wave function. And it matches nicely to what you expect for these dynamics. This is really sort of a new way of looking at basically the physics that you would get in a quantum gas microscope. Um, importantly, these dynamics can persist to long times and we can see a well-defined interference fringes out to many tunneling times over uh, 200 lattice site size systems. Um, uh, uh, we're using this for this idea um, um, proposed in 2004 by Andrew Childs for looking at search in these systems. Um, I'm not gonna say anything more about that, except that it's interesting. We're trying to figure out like where all the quantum mechanics is in these systems, because as uh, Grover pointed out at one point, actually all the physics of Grover's search you can do with oscillators. So with that, I will close. Uh, let me just acknowledge the group here. Um, so uh, uh, the Stranium team on the right, um, uh, Aaron Young is a, a senior PhD student, Nathan Shine's uh, postdoc, Will is um, uh, another PhD student, um, and then the Euterbium team is here on the left. We have Johanna Liss, uh, Ruku, and um, a postdoc, Alec uh, Jenkins. And then uh, a lot of work we've been doing has also been collaborating with June's group, uh, and especially the clock laser team there. So thank you. Thanks, Adam. So we've got some, please ask your questions. The first question is uh, from Daniel Paz asks, what generates this quantum walk? Is it purely coherent or decoherent dynamics? Sorry, it's purely coherent dynamics. Um, and this is because in this lattice, um, there's a tunnel coupling between, um, whoops. Uh, oh, I don't really have a good picture of that. Okay, um, so in this lattice, so each square in this picture corresponds to a lattice site. Um, and uh, uh, the eigenstates of these systems are not localized wave functions. They have coherent, um, their coherent superposition of an atom being delocalized on this. So if I prepare an atom in one site of this lattice, it's in a superposition of many single particle eigenstates, and hence you get coherent spreading of the wave function as those different components beat against one another. Romerick, you have a question? Um, yeah, um, I was uh, wondering why are you um, collecting the photons from the uh, blue transition when you do an image? Uh, because if you're uh, cooling on the red transition, there should also be scattered photon on the red transition. So if you're limited by the scattering rate of the red transition, why bother with an additional laser? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so, and this sort of gets at something I was saying before. So um, the reason we don't image on the red transition is because the scattering rate is still sort of low. It's about like as the highest it can be if you're saturating the transition the lifetime of the transition would be about 40 microseconds. Um, uh, and so that sets um, the scattering rate that you can get to, so about 25 kilohertz. Um, but you couldn't really operate in saturation. You'd have to operate a fair bit below that to get good cooling performance. And so you just can't collect photons fast enough to make a nice image. So the blue transition is a nice knob for having a variable scattering rate um, that we can tune. OK, thanks. Uh -huh. But in, let me point out though in Euterbium where that transition is broader, um, the lifetime is a microsecond. There you can do that. And Jeff has beautiful results on doing that. Actually in the Euterbium 171 experiment, we found it was pretty hard to use that transition, but using basically the technique that we use for strontium of both the blue and the, the narrow transition and the broad transition works quite nicely. So Anand had a question. Um, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you can load uh, multiple lattice sites with the tweezers. Like there's some limit to how close you can get to tweezers, right? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, good. Uh, uh, do you have another question? Oh yeah, and if you can, then how low in temperature can you get with respect to the tunneling or interaction? Okay, let me, I'll, I'll answer those separately. I guess obviously I'll answer those separately. Um, so, um, so the, this was actually always something that we wanted to do with these systems. And so the AODs that we use uh, were specifically optimized so that, um, you, you come from Manuel's group, so you know some of this stuff, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I came Okay, from so like the AODs that we use are, are longitudinal AOMs. They're not shear mode AOMs like you're used to using probably. So that means that the, the spacing, the frequency spacing between the traps is much higher for a given spacing for the same magnification. So that means that the beat note between those two tweezers is not so high that you keep the atoms out of the trap. So for um, a 568 nanometer spacing, which is the neighboring, um, which is the, 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 site, the lattice site spacing, um, the, the beat note is above two megahertz. So we don't get any heating from that. 
So the next challenge is the fact that the tweezers are, uh, you know, a finite size. Um, and so they are about 420 nanometers in this experiment. So if you bring two 420 nanometer tweezers close together, uh, specifically 568 nanometers apart, um, then you have a bump that separates them that I believe is about 30 to 40% high. Um, we actually originally were doing calculations for um, a retroreflected lattice, so not a bow tie lattice, so it was even closer. And there was 20%, I think. Um, so to the question of, of how many you could load in that way, I think we just need to learn. Like we, we haven't tested it out yet, but it was designed to try this kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you a number, but I will say that like we tried our best to like engineer this as far as possible in that direction. Um, then to the second question of the temperature, I would say the answer there is also we just have to see. But I, I think we're actually quite optimistic given the coherence of this tunneling. Uh, and there's a nice effect that we um, we actually anticipated this might be the case, but it works way better than any of us anticipated, which is that. Um, when we're hot, the atom just is gone. Um, and that's because we just don't have a balanced state above uh, the ground band. Um, and because the experiment's fast and you measure all the atoms at the end, you can just post-select on experiments in which you have the right number of atoms. So this is actually what we did in Marcus's lab, which is I think where you are now, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, for the entanglement entropy experiments, but there it was like phenomenally painful, right? Because our cycle time was a minute, but here our cycle time is under a second. Right, it's like half a second. So you can afford to throw away some statistics. Um, so uh, that is all to say, uh, uh, the ground state cooling seems very, very good in the lattice, especially in the center of the lattice. Um, but on top of that, to the extent that it's not good, we can post-select away a lot of entropy. And we can do so in, uh, in a way that's efficient with respect to time. Very cool, sounds very exciting. Thanks. So Elliot? Um, I had a question. Um... During the emission process, you mentioned these times where there was this atom-atom coherence, which to me sounds a lot like super radiant emission. I was just wondering if you could kind of comment on the difference. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so super radiant emission is, the, is, the, is a process by which um, the uh, uh, emitted light of a classical dipole um, stimulates the emission of other atoms that are at the same phase or, or, or evolving with the same um, uh, dipole emission pattern. Um, we are not in a regime where we see that. And in fact, uh, it's important to point out that sort of in a classical or semi-classical picture, uh, that emission rate will depend on the dipole matrix element. And because we're working with the bosonic isotope, that dipole matrix element is just like stupidly small. So like the power from this emission is like crazy, crazy small, even smaller than what it is in the millihertz wide transition in strontium 87. But nevertheless, uh, uh, those systems are so precise and sensitive that in fact they are slowly getting to the point where they might actually be able to see effects from uh, uh, at least interactions from exchanged photons, like like the physics observed in super radiance. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. So as much as I hate to cut off the discussion here, uh, in light of our special seminar today, I do think this is a good place to stop. So um, let's thank Adam again. And... Uh, we will reconvene here in 20 minutes. Remember uh, at 1 p.m. Boulder time, Leah will be giving his special um, seminar. Uh, so see you soon. Enjoy your lunch. Thanks again, Adam. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, see ya.